Now that we know what is a secular determinant and how it can be used to determine values in systems of equations, we can now examine one technique to solve the Schrodinger equation for multi-electron systems. This technique requires us to know how to calculate the energy of a system. Take, for instance, determining the ground state energy of some arbitrary system. The Schrodinger equation can be expressed with the ground state wave function, which we will denote as psi naught, and the ground state energy, denoted as E naught, such that the Hamiltonian times the ground state wave function is equal to the ground state energy times the ground state wave function. If we multiply both sides by psi naught star and integrate, we get the integral of psi naught star times the Hamiltonian times psi naught times dv is equal to the integral of psi naught star times the ground state energy times psi naught times dv. In this case, we're going to let dv represent the appropriate volume element. On the right-hand side, e naught is a constant, so it can come out of the integral. And so if we divide both sides by the integral of psi naught star times psi naught dv, we get the integral of psi naught star times the Hamiltonian times psi naught dv over the integral of psi naught star times psi naught dv, and that's all equal to the ground state energy. If psi naught is normalized, then the denominator would equal to 1. However, we will keep the denominator left unevaluated so that we leave open the possibility that psi naught is not normalized. The important thing to note here is that we have an expression which will determine the energy of a quantum system described by psi naught. Now, pretend that we do not actually know the ground state wave function psi naught. We can instead attempt to approximate it using a trial wave function, which we will call phi. We can calculate the energy of this wave function phi using the same procedure as before, meaning the energy of phi is equal to the integral of phi star times the Hamiltonian times phi dv over the integral of phi star times phi dv. Since the ground state energy is the minimum energy of a given quantum system, then the ground state energy of the system must be less than or equal to the energy of the trial wave function being used to approximate the actual wave function. This relationship between the two energies is called the variational principle, which states that E phi is less than or equal to the true ground state energy, E naught. The equality holds when the trial wave function phi is equal to the actual wave function psi naught. And if phi is, e is dependent on some fitting parameters, called variational parameters, then E phi will be a function of those variational parameters, denoted here as alpha, beta, gamma, and so on. So, starting with a reasonable trial wave function phi, we can minimize E phi with respect to each variational parameter and approximate the ground state energy E naught. For many applications, this is enough, as it does not matter if we actually know the ground state wave function psi naught. For example, let's pretend that we couldn't analytically solve for the wave function of the hydrogen atom, but we still wanted to determine its ground state energy. We would suppose that the actual wave function of the hydrogen atom of the ground state would decay since the probability of finding an electron very far away from the nucleus approaches zero. So we would choose a Gaussian function as our trial wave function, meaning that our phi is equal to e raised to the power of negative alpha r squared. And in this case, alpha is the only variational parameter. So let's apply this trial wave function using the variational principle to determine and approximate the ground state energy of the hydrogen atom. We will then compare this value to the actual analytically determined value, which is negative one-half times the reduced mass mu times the charge raised to the power of four divided by 16 pi squared epsilon naught squared h bar squared. In order to do this, we're going to follow these five steps that we have listed right here, being the first one we're going to calculate the integral of phi star times the Hamiltonian applied to phi. The second step is to apply or to calculate the integral of phi star times phi. Then using these two steps, step one and step two, we're able to solve for the energy of um, our wave function phi. What we're going to then do is we're going to minimize that energy with respect to alpha, our only variational parameter. And then finally, we're going to be able to calculate what our 
minimum ground state energy is using this E phi. So let's start with this first step, which is this solving for this triple integral of phi star times the Hamiltonian applied to phi. And what we're first going to do is we're just going to look at our Hamiltonian. And right here I've got the Hamiltonian written down incomplete in polar spherical polar coordinates. And what we're first going to notice is that when we look at our trial wave function, we're going to see that it's only a function of r. And what that means is that if I were to take phi and I were to have, a, have the Hamiltonian applied to it, which is what I'm trying to indicate down here, I would multiply this phi into all of these different terms. And the thing that you can immediately see is that these terms that have derivatives with respect to um, theta and phi those terms are all going to be equal to zero. And that's just because I have no function of theta and phi inside my trial wave function. I'm trying not to get confused that I'm using phi as my delimiter to, to denote this trial wave function. This is the phi's that are in here have to do with angular coordinate spaces as opposed to just a name. But the upshot here is that my Hamiltonian simplifies to look something like this where I'm just going to have negative h bar squared over 2 mu r squared dr, or sorry, d by dr of r squared times d by dr, subtracting e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r. So then our next step to solving this triple integral over the volume is to then apply our Hamiltonian to our trial wave function. And all that means is that I'm going to be writing out again what my Hamiltonian is, so negative h bar squared over 2 mu r squared, and that's going to be times d by dr times r squared d by dr. And from that I'm going to be subtracting off e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r. And then I'm just going to have all that multiplied by my trial wave function, which is just e to the negative alpha r squared. And then once I apply this, then I can then go back and I can actually solve this integral, or in essence, finish solving step one. What this means then is I'm going to distribute in my exponential term to the right-hand side to both these terms. And so that means then my Hamiltonian applied to my trial wave function is going to be equal to negative h bar squared over 2 mu r squared d by dr times r squared, or applied to, I should say, r squared, d by dr, and here's my trial wave function, e to the negative alpha r squared. And from that I'm going to subtract off the elementary charge e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r. Again, this is times my trial wave function, e to the negative alpha r squared. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to basically evaluate this differential, negative h bar squared over 2 mu r squared d by dr r squared times e to the negative alpha r squared, because basically when I take the derivative of an exponential, I get the exponential back, times the derivative of the argument of the exponential, and so that's why I get an extra negative 2 alpha r. And then I'm still subtracting off e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r e to the minus alpha r squared. So then the next thing is what I'm going to do is I'm going to now apply the differential to this whole term. What this looks like is, and this is basically me taking this whole term out and evaluating it on its own, is I'm going to have a minus 2 alpha, I have a d by dr, I have an r cubed e to the minus alpha r squared. And I just basically took out this 2 alpha, or this negative 2 alpha, just to simplify my expression. But here now I'm going to have, or I'm going to apply the product rule to evaluate this differential. So I'm going to minus 2 alpha. I have the first times the derivative of the second. So the first is r cubed times the derivative of the second minus alpha r squared times the derivative of minus alpha r squared, which is minus 2 alpha r. And to that I'm going to add the second, which is my Gaussian trial wave function, times the derivative of the first, 3r squared. 
And so then if I just start to simplify, I'm going to get minus 2 times alpha, all times minus 2 alpha r to the 4, times e to the negative alpha r squared, plus 3 r squared, e to the negative alpha r squared. And then my last step is just to multiply in this minus 2 alpha. And so what I'm left with is 4 alpha squared r to the raised to the power of 4, e to the negative alpha r squared, minus 6 times alpha r squared, e to the negative alpha r squared. And so this final term that I've just calculated here is what's going to go into my expression right there for that differential. So plugging that in, what we end up getting is Hamiltonian applied to my trial wave function, minus h bar squared over 2 mu r squared. Here's where this term gets plugged in. 4 alpha squared r raised to the power of 4, e to the negative alpha r squared. That we're going to subtract off. 6 alpha r squared e to the negative alpha r squared. And then for that I'm going to subtract the elementary charge e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r times e raised to the power of negative alpha r squared. And so my final step in this is that I'm going to then just multiply or distribute in this term that's here in the front into both my terms that I have here. And so doing that, what I end up with is h hat to the Hamiltonian times my trial wave function being equal to minus 2 alpha squared h bar squared r squared over mu times e raised to the power of negative alpha r squared plus 3 alpha h bar squared all over mu e to the negative alpha r squared. And from that, I'm still going to subtract e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r e to the negative alpha r squared. And of course, in these first two terms, all I did was I canceled out my 4 with my 2 and my 6 by my 2, and that's how I ended up with the 3 and the 2. And the negative sign right here was also distributed through, which flipped the signs.